IELTS Practice Tests Plus 2. CD 3. Test 5. Section 1. You will hear a conversation between a senior librarian and a woman interested in working at the library. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 7 on pages 109 and 110. You will see that there is an example which has been done for you. On this occasion only, the conversation relating to this will be played first. Um, I'm interested in doing some work for the library. Are you the person to speak to? Yes. Right. Well, um, what sort of work are you interested in? Well, I've just come to live here in Australia. I don't want a full-time job until my children have settled down but I really need to get out of the house a bit. And I heard you need voluntary workers for various projects. Right. The woman is interested in voluntary work, so C has been circled in the example. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 7. Um, I'm interested in doing some work for the library. Are you the person to speak to? Yes. Right. Well, um, what sort of work are you interested in? Well, I've just come to live here in Australia. I don't want a full-time job until my children have settled down, but I really need to get out of the house a bit. And I heard you need voluntary workers for various projects. Right. But I don't know if I have the right skills. Well, we do provide training. Oh! We always include an orientation to the library, together with emergency procedures. That's fire regulations, emergency exits, first aid so you can cope with accidents or sudden illness. Things like that which are necessary for anyone who's working with the public. Then we give specialist training for particular projects, like using our database system. I do have quite good computer skills, in fact. Oh, great. Is there any sort of uh, dress requirement? Well, all staff have to wear a name badge uh, so they can be identified if they go outside the staff-only areas. But apart from that, there aren't many regulations. We ask you to sign in and sign out for insurance purposes, but that's all. How about transport? Uh, do you live locally? Well, not too far away. I'm at Porpoise Beach. My husband needs a car during the day, but it's only about 20 minutes on the bus. In fact, we can reimburse part of your travel expenses in that case. Oh! Would that be the same if I came by car? No, uh, because parking is such a problem here. One thing we are looking for, though, is someone who can drive a minibus. No problem. So, do the projects involve going outside the library? Some, yes, but not all. We've just finished one which involved working with photographs taken of the area 50 or 100 years ago. It basically involved what we call encapsulation. Putting them in some sort of covers to keep them safe? Exactly. <laughs> it's time-consuming work and we were very grateful to have help with it. Then, sometime next year, we're hoping to begin working on an initiative involving the sorting and labelling of objects relating to local history. We'll be needing help with the cataloguing. Well, I'd definitely be interested. How about at present? Well, we have a small team who work to support those who are unable to read. Working with the blind? Yes, or other groups who have reading difficulties. We provide volunteers with equipment so that they can take books home with them and read them aloud onto CDs. We're gradually building up a collection that can be lent to those who need them. Mm, I can see it would be useful, but I'd really like to do some sort of work where I can get the chance to meet people. 
How about reading stories to children? That's done by our regular staff. But we do have another project. It's a very long established scheme which involves helping those who are unable to have direct access to the library. Oh, I noticed someone with a trolley of books when I was at the hospital last week. That sort of thing. That would have been one of ours, yes. It's one of our most popular services. Lots of people who wouldn't dream of going to the library normally when they're at home borrow a book when the trolley comes round the ward. I can imagine. <laughs> Yes, I'd definitely be interested in that. Right, so how do I enrol? Well, we do ask all volunteers to commit themselves to a regular period each week. I could probably do five or six hours.、Oh, be careful not to take on too much. But we do need someone for a couple of afternoons from two to four, so four hours altogether. That sounds fine. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, You have some time to look at questions eight to ten, on page one hundred and ten. Now listen and answer questions eight to ten. Right. So here's the application form. It asks the usual questions: name and address, and telephone number. You also need to fill in details of who we should get in touch with in case of any accident or problem like that.、Uh, we do need to have that filled in. And there's a space for date of birth, but that's only if you're over seventy-five. So、uh, we won't worry about that. No. <laughs> oh, it asks for qualifications. Do I need to provide certificates? They're not necessary. We'll need the names of two referees, not relatives or family members, obviously.、Uh, what else? Signature of parent or guardian. <laughs> That won't be necessary, as I assume you're over eighteen. Yes. <laughs>、uh, what's this? It says civil conviction check. That's a document we have to provide by law for those working on projects involving children. So we won't need it in your case, but you will need to sign this separate document. That's a, a copy of commitment. It's basically an agreement to work according to the library guidelines. So, if you'd like to fill this all in, you can do it here or take it home, whichever you prefer. I'll take it home if that's okay. Right. Well, thank you for your time. That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section two, on page one hundred and eleven. Section two. You will hear part of a local radio program about fighting air pollution in Canadian towns. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to fourteen, on page one hundred and eleven. Now listen carefully, and answer questions eleven to fourteen. Good morning, folks, and welcome to the information roundup on your own local radio station. This is Larry Knowles talking to you this morning on Tuesday, the twenty-fifth of May. And the first item coming up is a reminder to you all out there about Canadian Clean Air Day, which is on June sixth. In case you weren't around for the last one. 
This is a chance for Canadians everywhere to focus on the problems of air pollution and to actually try to do something to help reduce the problem. How many Canadians do you think die annually because of air pollution? 2,000? 3,000? Well, the rate is a staggering 5,000, and it's likely to grow, unless we do something. And it's this concern with your health that's the driving force behind the government campaign that is sponsoring Clean Air Day. So what causes air pollution in the first place? Well, the transportation sector accounts for 27% of all greenhouse gases produced in Canada. It's also the biggest source of that thick, polluted air from traffic fumes that we call smog. And it's the tiny particles and ground-level ozone in smog that are the main causes of health problems and even deaths across the country. Of course, it's worse in the big cities, but researchers have only recently realized that all you need are low levels of air pollution to seriously damage your health, so we're all at risk. You now have some time to look at questions 15 to 20 on page 111. Now listen and answer questions 15 to 20. So, what can we do to fight air pollution? Well, it should be pretty obvious by now that the way we get to and from work every day can have a big impact on the air we breathe. So the easiest action you can take on Clean Air Day is to accept what we call the commuter challenge and get to work on foot or by cycling for a change. If you have to use your car, try carpooling and share the drive, or better still, use public transit. If everyone tries this for just one day, you'll be amazed by the difference it can make to the air in our towns and cities. But there's more you can do to improve air quality. For example, you can plant trees. And if you don't have a garden, then you can do your bit in other ways. For instance, did you know that modern, improved wood stoves can reduce wood smoke by as much as 80 to 90 percent? So you can make a big difference if you upgrade the appliances you use in your home. The government is also working hard on your behalf to clean up our air. Its priority is to reduce the emissions that cause smog, and they have clear plans to get there. Last year, Canada and the United States agreed to reduce emissions on both sides of the border between the two countries, and they plan to reach their targets in the next few years. The government's also taking action to get cleaner fuels. It's already reduced the sulfur contained in gasoline, and it hopes to reach the reduction target for sulfur and diesel by next year. But the measures don't just focus on the motorist. The federal government's also working to reduce emissions from power plants and factories right across the provinces. You can find out all about government action and all the plans for Clean Air Day events. That is the end of Section 2. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 3 on page 112. Section 3. You will hear two geography students, Jack and Katie, talking about a field trip to Kenya in Africa. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 24 on page 112.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 24. Katie, hi. Thanks for inviting me round. Oh, thanks for coming. I know you're up to your neck in finals revision, but I've got to make up my mind about next year's geography field trip, and I'd really like your advice. We've got to choose between an African trip and one in Europe. They've told us a bit about both trips in the lecture, but I really can't make up my mind, and I know you did the African one last year. That's right. So where exactly did you go? I mean, I know it was in Kenya, in East Africa. Yes. Well, we were right up in the northwest of the country. It was beautiful. We stayed in a place called the Marich Pass Field Studies Centre. Right. Dr. Rowe said the accommodation was traditional African-style cottages. Uh, he had a special name for them. Bandas. Yes, they're fine. You have to share two or three people together. They're pretty basic, but you have a mosquito net. They don't provide spray, though, so remember to take plenty with you. You'll need it. <laughs> and there's no electricity in the field centre. You'll have hurricane lamps instead. They give a good light. It's no problem. What about places to study? Dr Rowe said there was a library? Yes, but it's quite small. There's a lecture room as well, but most of us worked out in the open air. There are plenty of places outside. And it's so beautiful. You're right in the middle of the forest clearing. I gather it's a relatively unmodernized area. Definitely. They actually set up the centre there because it's on the boundaries of two distinct ecological zones. The mountains, where the people are mainly agriculturalists, and the semi-arid plains lower down, where they're semi-nomadic pastoralists. Before you hear the rest of the conversation... You have some time to look at questions 25 to 30 on page 112. Now listen and answer questions 25 to 30. So how much chance did you get to meet the local people there? Did you get the chance to do interviews? Yes, though we had to use local interpreters, but that was OK. Then we did field observation, of course, looking at environmental and cultural conditions and morphological mapping. What's that? Oh, looking at the surface forms of the landscape, the slope elements and so on. What about specific projects? Yes. After the first two or three days, we spent most of our time on those. We could pretty well do what we wanted, although they all had to relate to issues concerned with development in some way. People did various things. Some were based on social and cultural topics, like the effect of education on the aspirations of young people. And some did more physical process-based studies, looking at things like soil erosion. My group actually looked at issues relating to water. Things like sources such as rivers and wells and quality and so on. It was a good project to work on, but a bit frustrating. We felt we needed a lot more time, really. Right. Dr Rowe did say something about limiting project scope. Yes, he told us that too at the beginning, and I can see why now. What else? Well, we had some good trips out as part of the course. We went to a market town, a place called Sigur, that was to study distribution. And to look at agricultural production, we went to the Weiwei Valley. That's an important agricultural region. And what about animals? Did you have a chance to go to a national park? Sure. We did a trip on the last day, on the way back to the airport at Nairobi. But actually, there was lots of wildlife at the field centre. Vervet monkeys and baboons and lizards. Mm, it does sound good. It was excellent, I'd say. In terms of logistics, it was very well run. But it was more than that. I mean, it's not the sort of place I'd ever have got to on my own. And it was a real eye-opener. It got me really interested in development issues and the way other people live. I did find it frustrating at the time that we couldn't get as far as we wanted on the project... But actually, I'm going to follow it up in my dissertation. 
So it's given me some ideas and data for that as well. So you'd say it was worth the extra money? Definitely. That is the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 4 on page 113. Section 4. You will hear a presentation by a student about a website she has designed for a supermarket. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40 on pages 113 and 114. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. For my website design project, I decided to approach SuperSave supermarkets because I have an evening job at the supermarket, so I already have a slight insight into their organisational goals and workings. The field research for my project was in two stages. First, I had an interview with Mr Dunn, who is in charge of SuperSave's customer care department. I discussed the project with him in order to identify the supermarket's requirements. Mr Dunn said customers are often unwilling to make a face-to-face -face complaint when they've experienced difficulties with a product or a member of staff or anything related to the supermarket. So he said a website which allowed members of the public to get in touch with the organisation and bring the problem to their attention in a private manner might be very useful. And we agreed that I'd work on this. For the second stage of my research, I devised a questionnaire to put to SuperSave customers. I needed to find out about the customers' experiences of problems together with their attitudes towards making complaints both directly and indirectly. I used a mixture of closed questions, such as, have you ever experienced a problem at any SuperSave store, and open questions, such as, what would you find helpful about a customer complaint website? I decided to do interviews, rather than rely on distribution of the questionnaire, as I felt this was likely to lead to a higher take-up rate. I visited four SuperSave stores, two in the city centre and two in the outskirts, and altogether I interviewed 101 respondents. Then finally, I analysed the results. I found the results of the questionnaires to be very informative. I found that out of the total number of customers investigated, 64% had at some stage encountered a problem in a super safe store. Out of these people, the vast majority said that they hadn't reported the problem to any member of staff. They just kept it to themselves. The next thing I tried to find out was why they hadn't complained. Well, about 25% of the people I interviewed said the reason was that they couldn't be bothered and a slightly smaller percentage said that they didn't have enough time but 55% said the reason was that they felt intimidated. I finally asked if they would be more likely to complain if they didn't have to do it face to face, and nearly everyone I asked said that they would, 95% to be exact. I then set about designing the website to meet these needs. 
once I'd completed the website, I made another appointment with Mr. Dunn to find out what he thought of it. Mr. Dunn said he felt that the pages would benefit his organization by giving customers a new way of expressing their complaints and by making it easier to collect complaints, identify specific places where service and customer care were not as good as they should be, and act upon them accordingly. Supersave is already a highly customer orientated organization, and he thought our website would be an excellent addition to their customer care effort. This is all well and good, but there still remains the general problem with websites.